Coast Lake. <laughs> so we really want to thank you all for coming. We want to thank the venue. This is so beautiful. And uh, I know Maureen and the family has such long, strong roots here in the area. Um, and uh, we really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. I think everybody's just so astonished these days when anyone can make any headway at all in the arts and have an actual book published. It's just so astonished. We're all just so crazy and wild. <laughs> chance to talk to Maureen later and some more drinks and food. So who we'd like to introduce right now is uh, our sister Rosie's youngest girl, Maureen's niece. She's going to read a little passage from Bob, uh, the book. Please welcome Aaliyah Newhouse. Thank you. 
walk-in, and on a vegetable side at that, didn't rank high on her list of creative touches. Maybe the ubiquitous suspected junkies were in her, or maybe the killer had wanted to start off 1986 with a dead body. Funny for your thoughts. Bet you must be thinking how creepy it is to fill a dead girl's shoes, or at least her job. Give me an answer. Rose smiled, gave the man a beer, and took his money. His opening line didn't encourage witty repartee. Maybe she should explain why she liked the murder she'd written better than one that had actually happened. <laughs> then tell him how creepy it felt working as a successor to the corpse. She could describe how horrified and frightened she felt thinking about her predecessor, Susan, as a real woman with a real name who had really been cruelly killed by a real murderer. By then, he would probably be relieved to hear she was able to find a tiny amount of comfort by thinking about it in the abstract. The coincidences between the events she'd plotted for her novel and the end of Susan's life were not all that eerie, if only you thought about them logically. Murderers only had so many ways to kill people, after all, and the anonymous copycat had paid for his plagiarism by providing her with a new job. Death struck a blow against unemployment. One bartender killed, another hired. Simple social work. Slow down, bro. Don't forget the First Amendment of bartending. Never tell a customer you're writing a book unless you want to hear the story he has for you. <laughs> the same one that's going to get around to writing himself one day. The one that will undoubtedly boast himself as a hero. Stories? He has stories. Believe it or not, just his life would. The forest would lose all its trees. <laughs> you're prettier than the one who died anyway. Thank you, said Rose. This gent had really flunked charm school. What should she reply? Oh, then it's good to use dead? Survival of the genius? Guess nobody misses the hag anyway. <laughs> she smiled again and tried to remember the weather forecast. Today was normal and seasonably cold for February in New York. No major storm or strong warming trend approach. If God had invented weather to give bartenders conversational topics, he should have made it consistently worth discussion. Good. I like girls to smile a lot. Matter of fact, I like everybody who works for me to smile. Good for business. Makes the customer happy. Makes the employee think she could be happy. Looks nice. A common round of laughs. Maybe he tip her with one of those adorable little smile buttons or some turn of the century coin. <laughs> <laughs> it's what restaurants sell, you know. Smiles. Food, booze, and smiles, and sex, or at least the smell of it. Know what I mean, sweetheart? This was getting trickier. Rose nodded and hoped it wasn't the lead-in to a come-on as she looked at the man more carefully. He was about six feet tall, early sixties, with thick hair graying away from dark brown. He would have been wiser to start with the light beers a while back. <laughs> she saw a glint of gold among the gray hairs on his floor to tan chest, which both a good mirror and a calendar would have suggested he cover by at least two more buttons. <laughs> he returned her look steadily. She doubted he'd ever suffer from the embarrassment of dropping his eyes first. Then he stood smiling. You'll be fine here, kid. I'm Joe Victors. I'm your boss's boss. Keep smiling. <laughs> the ten dollars he left on the bottom made the instructions easy to follow. Thank God she kept it up. Bad test to flunk. Jimmy stood at the service station. Two white lines, one red, and a rum and a diet coke. The girls are here early tonight. How do you like meeting God the Father? Who? Don't you, don't you know from whom all blessings flow? That august presence was God the Father, as we all adoringly call Joe. His son, Ben, who hired you, and whom you must never, ever call by his full name of Benito, is known as his son. Ben's brother, Thomas, completes the Trinity with the Holy Ghost, but you'll have to wait to meet him, since he's on one of his frequent and extended vacations. I imagine the shock of finding Susan's body and having to go through all those nasty police questions inspired his little John. Didn't seem to scholar. Did Joe give you the smile and smell of sex routine? He's not as stupid as he sounds. The only one of the Trinity with any real brain. Beneficent, too, because he paid for all the expenses of flying Susan's body back to Ohio, and rumor has it also picked up the funeral costs. At least he could do. Jimmy lowered his voice. He was so generous that he gave his precious son to the place. Well, they'd keep him out of trouble. The theory of infallibility is now open to serious question, however. You'll discover all of that yourself eventually, won't you? I hate to ruin any of the exciting suspense for you. Jimmy, you can't keep your mouth shut long enough to build up any suspense about your next work. Go check on your customers. Rose started sipping olives on the case for the martini rush. While Jimmy charmed his customer, she could think of a good topic as a sentence for the essay on my world history. He might decide to assign. Jimmy feigned his soap as he walked away, maintaining the mock adversarial role he and Rose had established the first night they worked together. Rose ignored his ask as she, as she considered his information. The bar she tended was part of an old restaurant in Manhattan's far west village. 
reading the writing on the wall or at least a real estate ad in the Times, the owners of my world had, had allowed evolution to start several years ago. This wasn't just a meat market area anymore. The restaurant had changed more gracefully than the neighborhood. Steam tables were deemed departed, but the food remained good, honest, and relatively cheap. Boxes and salads coexisted with meat and potatoes. The wine list graduated beyond by, by color, but still fit on the back of the menu. Gentle spices for strong drinks and the absence of fleshy chocolate delights gave the bar at least the illusion of integrity. The crowd seemed a good mix, too. Old-time village residents who remembered the place back when came in and charmed their more recent neighbors who had just recovered my world and loved it. Folks from other neighborhoods considered it a sign and swore several of their closest friends to mythical secrecy. My world succeeded because everyone thought it belonged to them. Not even Susan's murder last month seemed to hurt business. The curious came once or twice, and the regulars returned to sympathize. Some even admitted to feeling safer here now, since New York wisdom dictated that a recent, recently robbed place might stay safe for a while. The fact that the stabbing happened during a robbery seemed to be accepted as gospel by everyone from the press to the porter. My world was a good place to work if you had to work in a restaurant at all. If you wanted a goodly amount of cash and plenty of time to write, you might have to work in a restaurant. Relatively to spend all of the small advance your devoted agent had managed to wrangle for his second mystery novel. More slowly, she'd realized that it would be a long time before she saw, much less spent, her share of the profits from selling the Massachusetts restaurant she owned with her ex. Her pride in receiving any advance at all after the ten-year lull between the first published mystery and this work in progress had no buying power. But she needed cash and time. Knowing she'd gotten this job because her predecessor died still disturbed her. Died, her writer's mind insisted, what made a weakling synonym for stabbed to death. She had a bartending job and she had a writing job. The two were not the same, and combining them would be asking for trouble she didn't need. <coughs> Rose decided to try to live through the rest of the night without thinking about either the woman who died or the way she died. Imagination served her better when she wrote than when she tended bar. The service economy had its own grammar. Hey, beautiful, give me a double vodka on the rocks, then tell me, then let me tell you about the day I had. Mr. Distraction looked as if it had been a rough one. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 